Hello there, my fellow wizards, and welcome back. Welcome back to our quite long-running series at this point on the Colleges of Magic in Warhammer. Believe it or not, we are actually fairly close to finishing the entire series, since outside of this college today, there's only the Light College left to cover. Unless, of course, my memory fails me. So, for today's topic, we are gonna say a few words about the Celestial Order, what these fellows do, and what their college looks like. I'm your host, the Magister GDN for today, and without further ado, let us proceed, shall we? The Magisters of the Celestial Order study the lore of the heavens, also called the Blue Wind of Magic, Azir. In a more scientific terming, what they do is called astrometeorological thaumaturgy. The magic of the stars, the upper atmosphere, and the weather. Thus, the magisters of this college are often referred to as astromancers, and they are also prognosticators, astrologers, and seers without human peer. While these magisters can give the impression that they know everything, before you even open your mouth, that is not in fact the case. They do know when people are about to speak but they do not know what they are about to say. Therefore, it is possible to surprise them. The astromancers tend to be dreamers and very scholarly. They tend to look up to the heavens quite a lot with a contemplative look on their face. The main symbol of the astromancers of the Celestial College is the Comet of Power. This is maybe the most direct of all the iconography of all the Colleges of Magic because the power of the celestial wizards literally floats on the wind of Azir, among the stars. Every aspect of celestial lore is rooted in the movements of the heavenly bodies and their influence upon the world, and therefore it is of little wonder that celestial wizards display the source of their power openly. However, there are subtleties to the comet of power as well, which are lost to a casual observer. The narrow tail and broadening head of the comet mirrors the ever-expanding knowledge of the Celestial College. Furthermore, the comet is usually depicted with a head reaching skywards, symbolizing the transcendent ambition of a Celestial Wizard. Only on robes of mourning, worn in reverence to a departed member of the College, is the symbol inverted, commemorating a great man or woman fallen, in death, to the level of the common folk. The magisters of this college usually wear midnight blue as their prime color, and they will often wear pendants, rings, earrings, and brooches in the shape of moons, stars, and planets. Due to their great wealth, astromancers can tend to wear only the best of robes, and everything that they wear is of the richest material and best tailoring. The relationship between the wealthy people of the Empire and the astromancers of the Celestial College is sort of a love-hate one. Few nobles are those that do not wish to know how their future turns out for them, either in the short term or the long term. Fortunately, there is nothing in the Articles of Imperial Magic or in the Celestial College's own rules that forbids telling people their fortune, if that is what they want. However, there is one rule that the astromancers have to obey, and that is to tell the absolute truth all the time. This can be a double-edged sword for an astromancer, as they cannot always direct what areas of the future they will actually see. And so, they are very likely to see, for example, if a noble will gain political influence. But at the same time, they are just as likely to see the hour, the day, and the style of that noble's death. And, of course, they would be obligated to tell all of that to the person. As a result of this, although many nobles want to employ an astromancer, very few actually pressure him or her to reveal things too closely. Thus, at the end of the day, an astromancer can be quite wealthy. The Celestial College lies very close to the center of Altdorf, not far from both the Imperial Palace and the Great Temple of Sigmar. However, despite the bustle surrounding the College, almost no one ever sees it. The Celestial College is not invisible per se, nor is it disguised by powerful illusion. 
Instead, the spells that protect this college are subtly preventing the people from looking in the college's direction, or from paying any attention to whatever they may see. Clouds and mist intervene at crucial moments, and the wind blows flags, pieces of rubbish across the line of sight to the college's spires. People that live and work in the area know that there is something in that spot, but they have no clear memory of it or interest in finding out. Most assume it is a residential building, a private warehouse, or some other kind of structure that they have no interest in. However, someone who knows roughly where the college is, and is deliberately looking for it, can find the entrance. But even for such a determined person, they will rarely think to look up or around, and almost never pay attention to the door itself. Thus, if even the most determined non-wizard approaches the college, it is very rarely that they will notice anything other than the door itself. Of course, a person attuned to the winds of magic might be immune to this effect, and could see the college in its full glory. And when such people point the college out to bystanders, the effect is actually overcome for a while. For those that can actually see it, the college is one of the greatest sights in Altdorf. Sixteen slender towers, each one built in blue and white stone, reach high into the heavens. These are far taller than even the great spires of the Temple of Sigmar or the towers of the palace. Each one is topped by a glass dome, glittering in the sunlight and at night shining faintly from within. About 160 years ago, the patriarch of the time built the very first dome tower on the western corner of the building. This would spark what was called the Time of the Towers, in which the masters of the college built ever greater and higher towers, leading to the profusion of towers and observatories that exist today. However, once the number of towers reached 16, it was deemed by the masters of the college that those were towers enough, and then no more were built. The main door of the college is four yards square, divided into four sections, and finished in black metal. Dots of silver are spread across it, which forms a map of the night sky, albeit not of the sky visible above the old world. No one is ever kept waiting at the door. The doorkeepers always seem to know when someone arrives, and open the door just one moment before they knock. Thus, if a proper visitor will want to talk to a magister, the doorkeeper will know it, although not necessarily what magister is involved. This kind of prescience is partly the result of careful observation, but also partly magical. The doorkeeper only makes a mistake if a powerful spell is concealing the visitor's purpose. A hostile visitor is either ignored or threatened with the barrel of a blunderbuss through a port in the door. Inside the college is a cobbled courtyard which gives access to the many towers. There are no signs to show which door leads where, and so novices can be prone to getting lost. Inside the building are libraries, living quarters, and observatories. The air inside has no scent whatsoever, very similar to the air at the top of a mountain. Although they can be a little confusing, the corridors and courtyards of the college tend to have a calming effect on the mind. Visitors are allowed to go to a room of a magister unescorted, and servants tend to appear out of nowhere to repeat directions just at the moment when the visitor might appear lost. The magisters who want to receive guests invite them in at the very moment they arrive at the door without waiting for any kind of knocking. It is also worth noting that many of the magisters at the college tend to spend their days sleeping and their nights at the top of the crystal towers studying the stars. All the senior magisters have their own rooms, which are furnished in their own style. Mostly, this tends to be a celestial theme, and many rooms contain at least one large telescope and an astrolabe. Although the visitors may assume that they are constantly washed within the college, this is not in fact the case. Instead, the apprentice staff and the magisters always know when a visitor needs assistance, and turn up right at that moment. Sneaking into the college would require far more attention to one's surroundings than anyone without magic could ever manage. Proper guards rarely actually apprehend interlopers. 
Instead, the servants happen to go exactly to where such interlopers wanted to hide. Or they pop around the corner at the most inopportune moment. Often, not even the servants know how and why they appear at a certain point. The enchantments of the Magisters and the effects of Azir simply arrange things as they should be. Someone with very powerful concealment magic, like a Shadowmancer for example, might be able to overcome some of the obstacles. Although the lack of cover and the stillness of the college makes it very difficult to move around without attracting attention. Visitors without any magical assistance cannot sneak in the college at all, because there is always gonna be a servant standing there looking at them. Perfectly aligned between the towers of the Celestial College, and maybe the greatest artifact of the Order, is the Grand Astrolabe. This is an enormous device with a central gauge akin to the face of a clock, which spins on the head of a spike of purest silver. On its facings are hands and dials, each one whirling past intricately carved symbols to track and predict the alignment of the stars and the planets. These, in turn, are used to glimpse snatches of the future. The dial of the astrolabe which is watched most closely by the attendant acolytes is the twitching needle representing the moon of Morslaib. Should the dial signal the coming of a storm of magic, the celestial wizards are sent far and wide to prepare the empire for the coming storm. And this, my friends, has been what I wanted to tell you about the Celestial Order slash College of Warhammer Fantasy for today. Out of all the orders of magic, these guys are definitely the ones with their head in the clouds, so to speak. Nevertheless, they are a very powerful order whose magic has a lot of applications. I will also likely make another video on these fellows, where we're gonna talk about their apprentices and famous wizards. Now, is the Celestial Order among your favorite factions of magic? What do you like or dislike most about them? Do share your thoughts on the topic in the comments below if you want. If you found the episode informative or entertaining, please click the like, share and subscribe buttons for future content. Thank you very much for watching to the end, and may the blessings of Sigmar be upon you.